Okay, so um, we'd we'll just like to start the session um, with um, Shoal Druckmann, who's, uh, who was at Danelia and has uh, uh, recently uh, set up a lab at Stanford University. Um, and he's going to be talking about his work on cortical dynamics. Okay. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me well enough? Okay. Uh, let me just start my timer so that I know whether I'm on time. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, a bit broadly, given the fact that I assume not everyone here sort of is a full-time uh, neuroscientist. Uh, this might seem so broad as to be a bit naive, but I think it's actually worth thinking about. Right, so animals are pretty incredible, and the things they do are amazing, right? So you can go to the extreme example, like a bee finding food and communicating it to its friends uh, by a dance, or you can go just to, you know, a mouse doing whatever it is when mouses think when mice think they're not observed and, you know, just going about their daily business uh, in their natural habitat uh, and, you know, me meeting predators like ducks and very important things like that. And then, yeah, he makes it in the end. Right, so the, the reason I bring it up is I, I find this pretty incredible, right? The, there are these animals, they have this little things inside their heads, inside their bodies, and somehow that is the thing that we're trying to study. Right, so sometimes when you get lost in the businesses of, you know, dendrites and neurons and this and that and... Um, you know, this kind of neuromodulator, that kind of neuromodulator, it helps to actually think how amazing is this phenomena and how challenging it might be to understand that, right? So a slightly more uh, adult version of that is that we're interested in understanding the neural computations uh, that underlie behavior. And what's been very interesting in the past few years is that our ability to record uh, neural activity for animals that are actually behaving, that are performing some kind of task, is increasing remarkably, right? So Ken showed you a very nice example of this this morning. Uh, I'll show you another one. So this is the spatial temporal pattern of activity in a few hundred neurons recorded in cortex uh, by GCAMP Imaging in Carl Svoboda's lab. Uh, and what, and each one, uh, so we talked a bit about calcium imaging this morning, but just to make it clear, each one is, each dot here is a neuron. Uh, their, the level of their activity is color coded uh, so that warmer or pinker colors indicate high activity. And that's just a bunch of neurons that you can record and I'm just playing the activity over time while an animal is doing an extremely simple two alternative force choice task with a small delay. And what I want you to take away from this is not the pretty colors, but rather the fact that there are all kinds of weird spatial temporal patterns of activity here that don't have any obvious relationship to the task, right? So all the mouse needs to do is to figure out whether a pole was given up here or here and then report it a second and a half later. And yet you find all this weird stuff popping up, right? So to me that immediately raises a question of what are we going to do with that? Right, so there's one option, which is to say we're going to do absolutely nothing with that. Right, so technically in order for the brain to work and solve this task, all it needs is that the spatial temporal pattern of activity elicited by stimulus A, whatever it is, will be different than the spatial temporal pattern of activity elicited by stimulus B. I only show you the pattern for stimulus A, but you can take the pattern of stimulus B, do the coding analysis, it will take you five minutes. They're very different. This is all the brain needs and maybe we're done. Right, so I think that's one attitude. But I think there's a more interesting attitude that tries to take, to take the details of this data seriously, right? And tries to be bothered by the fact that this is perhaps not how I would expect that cortex um, to look like, right? Which brings you to the question, the other immediate question then, what exactly did I expect cortex to look at, right? Can I actually do this? Can I look at the spatial temporal pattern of activity of a few hundred neurons and say with confidence, so this is totally consistent with the animal doing computation X, but it's really not consistent with the animal doing computation Y. Or conversely, is this consistent with theory of cortical function A, but not theory of cortical function B? And I think what the ability to record this data uh, highlights is that we're very far away from it, and I think this is something that we need to deal with. In my personal opinion, the reason that we're very far away from being able to do that is that we just have terrible intuition for parallel distributed computation. Right, so may, uh, maybe I should speak just for myself. I have terrible intuition for parallel distributed computation. Right, so if you take 500,000 neurons, I, I don't know, take a billion, as many as you want, each one connects to a thousand others. They're all constantly transmitting information between themselves, computing something with your dynamics. And then you want to ask yourself, what should this thing look like while it's doing it? And why does it look one particular way or another? You quickly realize that you have no intuition for this mode of computation. So it becomes very difficult uh, to check it against data. Right? So, put, um, so the central notion behind this kind of thinking is that the brain does this and the principles of how it does it are embedded in the details and we need to learn how to uh, 
understand these details and how to deal with these details if we want to learn the unique computational style that the brain has. You don't have to, right? You can just do machine learning in general and understand intelligence, but if you are seriously interested in understanding how the brain does its own version, then this is something that we have to deal with. Every time that we see something surprising, I think we should think about why that, how that fits into our conceptual model, and if it doesn't, then, you know, try to rethink things a bit. Does that make sense? Uh, so, related to uh, Moritz's talk before, then, you know, we're very used to structure-to-function questions in biology when it's physical structure, right? So, synapses and wings and things like that and how they relate to actual function. But now that we're able to record dynamics in detail, we see that they have their own rich structure. And that structure is somehow related to the function to computation, and we need to sort that out, and then we can sort out the structure to dynamics part, right? So just like Moritz showed us all this beautiful structure, it would be really weird to just ignore that and say, oh, what the hell, you know, there's a different way for the brain to work that doesn't have all that, so we're not going to bother about these details. I think it's just the same thing, that we now have the ability to record these dynamics. They're much more con complex than we would have naively expected, so I think it really makes sense to try and look at this. Okay? That was perhaps an over-long uh, computation uh, introduction, because, of course, the question is, how do you do this? And this is the main thing that my lab is interested in. So wh when you talk about computation, one can talk about it in general. I don't even know exactly what that means. So you need to pick something specific. The thing I like is short-term memory, which is the ability of animals to generate persistent and selective representations from transient stimuli. Uh, okay, so the classical example is a delayed match to sample task. So the monkey sits on a chair. He fixates at a screen. You show it an image. There it was, and then there's going to be a delay period from a few seconds to a few tens of seconds, and then you're going to show it the second image, and the monkey's job is to say whether they're the same or different. So the first image uh, was the Janela Research uh, Campus building, the second was the Eiffel Tower, so if the monkey is smart, he'll say they're different, and if he's really smart, he'll say that apparently they're the same length, they've put end to end, and equally popular as tourist destinations. Um, so th this might seem like a pretty naive computation, uh, and might be very simple, but there are some key properties of it that I really like. Right, so the first is that every time that you introduce a stimulus to a brain, then you can't control the computations that are happening. Right, you give a sensory stimulus, all kinds of things are happening, pattern discrimination, pattern completion, bandwidth equalization, many, many things that have been described in the literature over the years, and you just can't control those. But having this delay period in the middle, in which you're no longer presenting sensory stimuli, in which hopefully the main computation that's going on is just this maintenance uh, of this one particular thing that the uh, mouse or monkey needs is a very unique opportunity. And the other thing is that I think this is the simplest computation of building a model of the world, which is, I think, what brains are for. Right? So, for instance, um, if I turn my back to you, which will be extremely rude, but I'll do it anyhow to make the point, right, then, you know, the, the image of you is totally disappears from my retina, but when I turn back, I'm not surprised that you're here, but, but that's because I did that for a second. If I would do that for 20 minutes, then I'd be pretty surprised if you're here. I mean, I know this is Canada, so people are extremely <laughs> polite. Uh, so it's possible that I would have to do it longer. But, but, and, you know, but if I do it for two hours, I won't be surprised that the table is still here. Right? So you know, it might be too fancy to call this building a model of the world, and I don't want to say too much about it, but just to say that this business of generating persistent representations of the world, to me, is, I think, extremely interesting and just indicative of a more general part of even more interesting um, things that animals need to do. Okay, so what's the simplest way this could work? So imagine you have a, a single neuron. This is uh, time on the x-axis and firing rate on the y-axis. Uh, so I'm not supposed to use my la the laser pointer, but I'm not sure I'll deal with that. So we'll see how that goes. So there are two interesting times, the times of the first image presentation and the second image presentation. And a very sensible way to do this would be to just have a neuron that codes for this image. Since it codes for this image, when you show the image, the firing rate goes up, and then the firing rate remains stable and elevated through the entire delay period. Right? So this would be a very reasonable way to build this computation. And when these experiments were done in the early 90s and when neurons like that were discovered, it was extremely exciting because neurons have biophysical time constants of tens of milliseconds, and it's not obvious how you generate something that suddenly has a time constant of many seconds. Right? So this was extremely exciting, extremely interesting from a biophysical perspective, but from the conceptual perspective, it's not that exciting. Right? You need to generate a persistent representation, so you just have a neuron that codes for it, and you generate persistent activity in that neuron. But what was then observed is that actually these neurons are extremely rare. Uh, so they're about 3 to 5% of the population. And if we look at most of them, they just look different. So ignore the different colors, they're different stimulus conditions, that doesn't matter for now. Just look at the temporal profiles. So the first one starts up and then goes down. This one on the bottom left starts low and then goes up. Uh, this one on the top right only remembers that it needs to respond in the end. And there are all kinds of weird things, but whatever all this is, it's not a stable and persistent representation. 
And this immediately leads us to something weird. So we all believe that neurons code for things with their firing rate. We know all the monkey needs to do is to remember this one thing. We know he's able to do that because he does the task. And yet what we find is that the activity of almost every single neuron is constantly changing during this delay period. Uh, so in cases like this, when our intuition uh, is tricky, it's worth trying to think a bit more abstractly. Uh, so bear with me while I do this. So imagine you want to represent points on a plane, not images. That's a stimulus of dimensionality too. Uh, one very reasonable way to do this is with a linear population code. So each neuron has a preferred direction in space. Neuron 1 likes this top left direction. Neuron 2 likes this top right direction. And imagine I want to encode this point in space. There is one very easy way to do that, which imagine just the activity of neuron 1 is at half. So I'm scaling down this vector by half. And it's a linear population code, so I'm going to sum across all the neurons. Neuron 2 had activity of 1, so I didn't scale it down. I add vectors like you add vectors, tip to toe, and I find myself encoding the right point in space. Okay, but now imagine that neuron 1 is ramping up and neuron 2 is ramping down, so now the vectors scale differently. If they scale differently, they'll add up differently, and I'll find myself encoding a different point in space, which is, again, just our intuition that if neurons code for things with their firing rates, the firing rate changes, so should the representation. However, this, this intuition is extremely misleading every time uh, that you have more neurons than dimensions of stimulus that you're trying to represent. Um, this can happen sort of by force when you have a divergent architecture like the classical thalamocortical projection where there are 50 times or 100 times many more neurons in cortex than in thalamus, but often we're just interested in situations which we have, I know, 100 million neurons in a cortical area and we're encoding basically one simple thing. Okay, so how does that change the picture? Well, it changes it dramatically. You don't need to go to 100 million dimensions. It's enough to look at just three dimensions. So now you have three vectors. You need to arrange them in a plane. If you choose this arrangement, this is called the Mercedes-Benz arrangement in the applied math literature, believe it or not. Um, this could be called the peace sign arrangement, but I don't know whether there was DARPA funding or something. Um, and then now the picture is totally different. So if you want to encode this point in space, you can do it just fine by having the acti activity of neuron 1 at 1, but you could also do it equally well by the activity of neuron 1 at half and neuron 2 at 3 at minus half. They will add up to be exactly the same thing. And you don't have to have negative activity. That's only an artifact of using three neurons. Uh, which is just done here for simplicity. And of course, it's not that you just have two patterns of activity. You have an infinite number of patterns of activity shown in the same way, um, sort of level of activity in a bar plot below and how they, uh, above, sorry, and how they add up below. And since it doesn't matter which of these patterns you choose to represent, there's no change in the coding, we, uh, and later others, uh, chose to call these non-coding uh, or null patterns. But of course, it's not that the entire network could only represent one point in space. That would be really weird there are different patterns of activity that do cause a change of representation, right? So here activity is changing and also the place uh, that's being coded for, the position in space that's being coding for is changing and since these patterns do cause a change of representation, we call these coding patterns. Does that make sense? So an efficient way to think about it uh, is again in this uh, space of neural activity so you can present the activity of a network at a given point in time by a dot of a space equal to the number of neurons so here, uh, this dot is above on the one axis, so neuron one has some activity and it's on zero in neurons two and three, so there's no activity in neurons two and three. And then the dynamics of the network are just how this dot evolves in time. And the realization is that every time that you have more dimensions, uh, more neurons, sorry, than dimensions are trying to represent, there's going to be some degree of freedom, our null space, uh, we call it null space just because of the relation to linear algebra, or our non-coding space, uh, that if you change the activity along that direction, then nothing will change the representation. And the animation in the bottom right was just me pushing the activity up and down this direction, okay? So of course, when we observe a bunch of neurons, we don't observe the full uh, dimension. We typically observe a very small fraction of them. If we observe only one, like in uh, some of these classical experiments, then I can make this neuron look like any arbitrary PSTH uh, that exists just by the correct dynamics along this degree of freedom, which won't cause a change of representation. Right? So what this sort of somewhat abstract thinking has taught us that even a computation as simple as keeping track of a perfectly persistent stimulus can come with more complicated dynamics than you might naively expect. Okay? But the real question is, which someone, if it were a slightly less polite audience, someone might ask is, you know, um, is, oh, oh um, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to this. You know, is this just fun uh, linear algebra of a bored physicist or does it actually have anything to do with the brain? Uh, so there's going to be one way to show that. Before I show you, there are going to be several ways to show you. Before I get into that, uh, I want to uh, make two comments about this. The first is that this is fundamentally uh, 
a theory of population coding, right? So if I observe, as I mentioned before, if I observe one neuron at a time, um, then you have no way of knowing whether it's changing because it's taking a part in a meaningful pattern or a non-meaningful pattern. But there's something even more important that uh, what this work tries to uh, address is what is the unit that we choose to ascribe meaning to when we do a neuroscience experiment. Right? So it used to be when you could only record one neuron at a time that everyone would try to interpret uh, the brain through, a, through the picture of single neuron activity. That's kind of slightly in the past now, and then people have switched to ensembles. Right? But usually they mean kind of the same thing. Right? So for instance, you would have one selective ensemble which would have simple dynamics and another non-selective ensemble which would have whatever dynamics you want, but still it's you know, these picture of one ensemble that's important, another ensemble that's not important. This is a very different picture. So there are no two ensembles here. There's just three neurons. There's one ensemble. And the unit that we're going to ascribe meaning to is a specific, a specific pattern across this uh, population, right? So one pattern is going to be extremely meaningful and another pattern is going to be extremely non-meaningful. And if we choose to believe that, that has fundamental conse consequences for the kind of experiments we want to do, the kind of perturbation techniques we feel like we should develop. So it's an important thing, and I hope to convince you uh, that it's worth your time thinking about that. Okay, so um, what's the extreme version of how you could tell that this is not just linear algebra for board physicists? So imagine I can go into a circuit, I can map out what I, record a bunch of neurons, map out what I think is the non-coding space, and what I think is the coding space, and now I can do an experiment that specifically pushes activity only along the non-coding direction. You would expect there to be no behavioral effect. And I can do a different set of trials in which I'll push the activity specifically along the coding direction, and then you might expect that I would be able to generate a behavioral effect. Does that make sense? That's not quite what we did. Uh, so the technology to do that is very difficult. We're pursuing it now. Uh, but that data, though very interesting, is a bit too raw to talk about. What we did is a zeroth order version of that experiment, which we basically just bonked uh, the network with a large perturbation, then it was up to us by analysis to figure out whether in certain cases we have uh, perturbations that go along more in one direction or along another direction, sort of sort everything throughout by analysis instead of by doing the proper experiment, but we're now also trying to do the proper experiments. Okay. Um, oh, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, so on to the data. So, okay, so as I mentioned before, this is a two alternative force choice task with a delay. Um, so a pole goes up in one of two positions, and the mouse is trained so that if it goes up in one position, he licks left, and if it goes up in another position, he licks right. And this is what it looks like uh, while he's doing it. Pole goes up, there's a delay, and then he licks. Pole goes up, there's a delay, and then he licks. And they look awful cute while they're doing that. The second thing that you want to do is you want to record dynamics uh, from a relevant area. And this is the point to say that uh, my lab at, the, at this time doesn't do um, experiments. Uh, so all of this uh, work uh, was done in collaboration with the Soboda lab, uh, and the first part was done by Nuo Li, who is an extremely uh, talented uh, post, who was an extremely talented postdoc in Carl's lab. Now he has his own group in Baylor, and if you're looking for a postdoc and you're doing experiments, I would definitely say go to Nuo. He's fantastic. He's looking for postdocs. Um, and then later, Kayvon, who's a postdoc who's joined between Carl and myself, joined to the project, and he's also now doing the, the more sophisticated perturbations. Uh, that will hopefully soon we'll have enough data to talk about them in detail. But none of this could have happened uh, without uh, this collaboration and without Carl's generosity to try to sort of ask uh, some of the you know more out there theoretical ideas um, with his uh, lab's time and resources. Okay, so previous work in the Soboda lab has told us where one should record. So the experiment that it was done, I'll just go over it briefly, is basically you take cortex, you inhibit different parts of it, you do this on a grid, and then you're looking for an error that has a, a specific pattern uh, of deficit, which is when you shut it down during the sample period, then there's no, uh, when you shut it down during the sample period, there is no behavioral deficit, since this is a memory area, but when you shut it down during the memory area, there's a very strong uh, deficit in the animal's ability to do the task. Uh, you find that, that's this area in the top left, you call it something, in this case ALM for anterior lateral motor cortex, that's where it is, and then Nuo uh, goes in with electrodes. I know in the beginning I showed you some calcium data, all the rest is going to be uh, electrophysiology since it's much easier to talk about uh, sort of fine scale temporal dynamics with electrophysiology, and then you look at the neurons and first of all you find neurons that have persistent activity during the delay period, you find neurons that have selective activity during the delay period, this neuron has this particular dynamic, this neuron has weirder dynamics. It ramps up for one trial condition and kind of ramps down for other trial condition. This neuron has dynamics but no selectivity, and you can find pretty much whatever you want uh, 
uh, in this zoo of neurons, very much like uh, Romo's classical data. Okay? And now the experiment, uh, in this case, the perturbation is going to be photoinhibition, uh, which is you try to delete spikes by activating inhibitory neurons. This was calibrated in separate experiments to destroy basically all of the activity in about a one millimeter area. So again, this is not sort of the precise activity space-specific perturbation that we want, but it has uh, this very interesting flavor of we're going to observe the dynamics, perturb them, and then actually observe them as they recover and observe behavior as it recovers and try to then relate one to the other. Okay, does that make sense? Good. So let's just get into the data. This is a sample neuron. Uh, raster plot above shows uh, spikes as a little tick, and then PSTH below shows you the average across trial uh, firing rate for these two different conditions. So this neuron has very uh, so it has activity during the delay period. It ramps up very strongly. There's much more activity for the lick right trials than the lick left trials. And then uh, when you do the perturbation on a subset of trials, then ad as advertised during the perturbation, the firing rate goes down to essentially zero. But then what was interesting is what happens after. Right? So if you stop this perturbation early, what you find is that the firing rates are recovering, which is not obvious since basically all of the models of these networks uh, work by having sort of these recurrent dynamics that are meant to supply memory. But what was even more interesting is that they recover with the correct selectivity. So blue was above red before, and blue is still above red after. Right? And given the fact that they recover with the correct selectivity, it wasn't a surprise that the animals are actually totally fine with this perturbation, even though you're taking the activity in the relevant brain area and wiping it out uh, for a few hundred milliseconds. Um, but what was even more curious is that if you have a sharp eye, you might notice that it looks like the activity is recovering awfully close to where it should have been had you not done this perturbation. Right? So you can see that the, the, blue t the, the light blue trial is the non-perturbed version of the dark blue trial, and you see that they're coming up awfully close to each other. It's not some artifact of just post-inhibitory rebound. You can look at this for neurons that are ramping down, and you see something um, very similar. And you can do the statistics carefully to show that this is a real effect in many neurons. But importantly, it's in many neurons, but not all of them. Right? So there are neurons like this in which the original activity in light blue looks nothing like the recovery from perturbed activity in dark blue. And this is something that we'll return to uh, in a few slides. OK, so w w why was this surprising to us? So memory models, circuit models of memory are very popular. There are dozens of them. And none of them have this uh, prediction, basically. So the, the, sort of the short version of the reason is that if you want to build a memory network, then you're basically turning, taking something that is a pulse of information and turning it into a step of representation, right? So what you're building is essentially an integrator, and then an integrator has a very different prediction. Uh, so in order to generate this ramp, you actually have an integrator that's feeding into an integrator, and then if you stop this integration during the delay period, maybe even shut it down to zero, you'd expect to have this persistent gap it has to do with the amount of time that you did the perturbation, which we just don't see in our data, even though we tried in multiple ways. Okay, so this is why we found it quite surprising. But there's a very trivial explanation that could have been true. Right, so imagine this brain area is just a readout of where the interesting stuff happens. So then this is kind of what you'd expect to see, right? So when you shut it down, you can't see anything. But the, since you haven't affected where the real stuff happens, then, you know, you just see that it recovers when you stop perturbing it. Uh, this is an argument that's very hard to absolutely shut down because you can never say that something didn't happen anywhere else in the brain. But let me give you a couple of lines of evidence why we don't think that's the case. So the first has to do with playing with the amount of inhibition. Uh, so imagine you, what I told you up until now was for inhibiting an area that's roughly a fourth of this brain area. You can then max out the inhibition and catch this entire brain area. And there's almost no uh, difference uh, in the behavioral effect. But as soon as you put some inhibition in the two hemispheres, then you find that there are massive deficits in behavior. And indeed, if you totally shut down the two hemispheres, the mice become at chance. Right? So what this data strongly suggests is that what is preserving uh, this memory is some kind of interaction between the two hemispheres, as if the other hemisphere somehow has a copy of the relevant dynamics and is feeding it back into the hemisphere after you just uh, perturbed it. And the second line of evidence is you actually cut the corpus callosum, uh, which I thought there would be no way the mouse would still you know, uh, work after that, and yet Nuo did it, and the prediction that comes out is the right prediction, right? That the mouse is still able to do the task, but now it's extremely sensitive to unilateral perturbation. So, you know, w once we saw something like that, it, it led to an immediate question of, you know, wh what do we exactly mean when we say the activity needs to recover, right? What do we mean when we say there's a copy of the dynamics on the other side? I mean, uh, you know, one wouldn't seriously expect every single idiosyncratic twist and turn of every single neuron PSTH to be stored in the other side. 
right, and then to somehow be magically restored by a bunch of axons going through. Uh, so in order to look at that, uh, we turn to uh, the same activity space analysis, only now we're going to look at things along specific dimensions, which are rotations of the space. Uh, sometimes these are called modes. Uh, the classical example is principal component analysis. So imagine you have two neurons. Each dot is a trial. These two neurons have some firing rate on each one of these trials, and I'm just scattering all of the trials uh, on one plot. So what principal component analysis tries to do is to find a direction in the space, which is just a particular weighted sum of neurons, that maintains a lot of the variance. Right, so if I take a bunch of trials just to make visualization easier, I project it down, I project all of them down, this direction activity space maintained some amount of variance. Right? But if I switch to a different direction, which again, just a different uh, weighted sum, now 0 0.25 times neuron 1, not 0 0.75, this will retain a different amount of variance. And eventually, as I'll twist things around all the way, I'll find this direction, which is the first principal component, which captures the maximum amount of variance when you project that data down. Does that make sense? Good, that's not what we did. Uh, <laughs> this is the point where usually people fall asleep, so I want to make sure that uh, uh, we did uh, something similar conceptually but distinct, which is linear discriminant analysis, where now you have two trial types, red and blue, and what you want is not to maintain the maximum amount of variance, you want to maintain decodability. You want to maintain your ability to predict what the animal is doing. And if I now take the choice that was just the first principal component, this is not a very good choice, because in this bottom left area, things are heavily mixed. But now, as I twist the vector around again, uh, then my presentation gets stuck. Uh, okay. As I twist it around again, I find this direction, which once you project down, then things are easily decodable just by throwing a threshold there in the middle between the two groups. Right? So this is linear discriminant analysis. It's, of course, a very old technique. Um, and I purposefully chose the data so that the first principal component and the first discriminant component are different, but this doesn't have to be the case. Right? So if the data were otherwise arranged, they could be the same, but there's no reason a priori to think they might be. Okay, just to be over didactic about it. Okay, so we find that direction, and now, of course, what does it look like in the data? So we take the neural activity, we project it uh, along this uh, linear decoder, and then we just look at a single trial over time. That's one single blue trial. This is one single red trial. They're very different. These are all of the trials uh, from this session. They are really different, and it's very easy to decode what the animal is going to do. Okay, and you can average across sessions. It's an even uh, stronger effect. But what's interesting is not just these dynamics. This is wh what we were kind of expecting from single neurons having decodability. The question is what happens during the perturbation, right? So I'm keeping the, the unperturbed data in these dashed lines um, uh, in the background and now showing you in thick lines the perturbed data. So when you do an ipsilateral perturbation, of course, during the perturbation, the difference in between the two shut down because the firing rates are all going to zero. Uh, but once you stop the perturbation, things kind of spring back up and there's again, they're again highly separable. But what was more interesting is actually the bilateral uh, data. So now we shut down both hemispheres. The animal is a chance. Uh, most of the animals are a chance. Many of the animals are a chance. And now the presentation indeed looks highly mixed. Right? But we can use this mixing sort of as a feature, not as a bug. So if this really is the pattern of activity that's going to be relevant for what the mouse is going to do, then we might be able to predict what the mouse is going to do, even though the mouse himself apparently is unable to do it because he, he, he is still a chance. And how would that work? So this average is a very wide average in the sense that there are some trials that recover beautifully, like this red trial, and there are some trials that recovered so poorly that they went all the way into the area that's normally associated with a lick left decision. And if this really is the important direction in activity space, then uh, we should be able to take these specific trials, look at where they stand at the end of the delay period, um, and then see uh, how that relates to behavior. So that's exactly what we did. We took this direction. Uh, we bin trials according to where uh, they fell at the end of the delay period. So if they fell into this area on the left, which is the area on lick left trials, if they fell into the area on the left, which is the area that's normally associated with a lick left decision, if they fell all the way here into the maximum case, then the mouse will be right on 100% of these trials. If they fell into the area that's normally associated with the opposite decision, then on these particular trials, the mouse is going to be completely wrong. Right? So we can basically predict what the mouse is going to do, even though the mouse himself is unable to do it. Uh, you can look at lick right trials, and it's quite symmetric. And this is the picture that we get. Right? We have this one direction activity space that have dynamics that can easily tell apart what the mouse is going to do. And these dynamics matter even when uh, you do a perturbation that causes the mouse himself to be confused. But that's not the only direction activity space. You can look for more directions. You have more than one neuron, so generally you're going to be able to find one direction. Depending on how the variance is spread, there's a limit to how many directions you can find, but almost always you'll be able to find two. 
So then we look for one on purpose that's very different. So we saw that this direction recovered, and now we want to look for one that's the opposite, right? We want to look for a direction activity space that actually doesn't recover at all. Uh, you can do that. And this is what the projection looks like. So as you can see, the light blue traces look very different from the, uh, from the blue and red traces, which is where the dynamics normally are. But it's not surprising that you can find that. What's more interesting is to see what it looks like when you're not perturbing the system. Right? So one hypothesis is that it has nothing to do with the normal dynamics of the system. So when you look at this particular direction in control trials, you'll see that there's no variance in it. Right? It captures nothing of the normal activity. This is actually very different from what we find. We find that this perturbed mode captures almost as much variance as the first mode, uh, which is the one that sort of, oops. Uh, yeah, I have uh, <laughs> to speed up. Sorry, I, I'm almost done. Uh, which captures, uh, I, I, I did a really way too long introduction, sorry. Uh, which captures sort of, so it, it has a similar amount of, uh, of variance to the first direction, which is the one that will determine the animal's behavior. But when you try to decode things out of it, it's much, much, much worse, right? You can barely decode things only in a subset of trials. So what this might remind you of is that we have this type of, uh, we have this direction of activity space on the right, which you can't decode anything out of, and the brain chose to leave it to be not robust. Right, it didn't bother to build robustness into it. And you have this direction in the left which you can use to predict behavior one-to-one, -one, and the brain chose uh, to make it robust. Right, so when we wrote the theory paper about sort, of these diff about sort of this interpretation of neurons through directions and activity space, we weren't smart enough to make this prediction. Uh, that happens often in theory. But uh, here, you know, no one thought there would be robustness, so <laughs> maybe that's an excuse. But if you were to build a system, this is what you would do. If robustness was expensive to build, you would put it into the components that are important, and you probably might not put it into the components that are not important. So if you're building a, a space shuttle, you probably should put it into the engine's robustness, but not maybe into the system that the astronauts use to send emails or something. Um, and this is exactly what we found, but the thing that's so interesting about it is that this is, the correct explanation is not on the level of single neurons. So this is a scatter of all the neurons, their projection on the selective and non-selective modes. Uh, so the neuron that I showed you in the beginning that looked like it recovered beautifully was the one that I purposefully chose uh, that has a projection of one on the selective mode and zero on anything else. And the neuron that I showed you that looked like a mess was again one that I purposefully chose that has a projection of zero on the selective mode and high projections on the other modes. So its activity looks by eye like it's nothing similar. But if you look at most of, of all of the neurons, they're a mix. Right? These were just two cherry-picked examples. So the level of single neuron is not the level where you find the correct explanation to this robustness. And it's not in the level of selective ensembles versus non-selective ensembles. So this is you know, not real data that would show you how it would be if there was a selective ensemble. But you would have a bunch of neurons that have a strong weight on the important modes and no weight on the non-important modes. And you have a bunch of other neurons that have no weight on the discriminating modes and a lot of weight on the non-important mode. This is about as different as can be from the picture that we find. Um, okay, so there's a modeling section on how does one obtain such robustness, which I'm going to totally skip over. Um, okay, I'll totally skip over it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just to say that we can do it. Uh, right, so in general, modeling can tell you one of two things, right? It could give you a serious hypothesis for how things happen, or it can just tell you that you don't need to invoke witches and dragons um, to assume that this thing is true. Uh, let's just say that we don't need to invoke witches and dragons to assume this is true. You can sort of build these uh, very reasonable circuit models that have this property. Um, so I'm sorry I had to skip that uh, section. Um, uh, let me just summarize our findings. So we find the surprising robustness of the detailed trajectory. And the important thing was is that the right way to explain this robustness is really by looking at these directions of activity space. And then this goes along with our theoretical model that not all population activity modes, not all directions in activity space are created equal. Of course, the issue is that when you do a bunch of populations recordings, what you're seeing is a sum across all of them, superposition of all of them, and then you need to somehow dissect that. And in this case, you actually really needed the perturbation experiments uh, to be able to do that. And that's not trivial in any case. Um, so I'll steal just one minute uh, to say uh, a philosophical epilogue here. So I think this uh, piece of work was very interesting, not for the stuff I showed you, but for the amount of questions that came out of it later, which we're still trying to follow up. Well, I think the stuff I showed you was interesting, otherwise I wouldn't have bothered with it. But, but you know, why were we able to, um, why did this thing work? It worked, but we had a very straightforward uh, conceptual framework for how the theoretical question we're interested in should play out in data. 
Uh, and I think that's why we were able to design the right experiments, get them done, and know what's the right analysis to do. That ends up being very tricky, because in order to do something like that, you actually do need to know what exactly is the circuit trying to compute, and you need to know what it would look like as it does that. Right, so any of the two alone would be enough. So if I knew what the circuit is trying to compute, I can just look in the dynamics and say, aha, that's how it gets done, and then write that down, and we have an answer. If I had a book that magically says what are all the computations and how they look like in population activity, then I could just look and say, oh, mouse is doing computation 23 now. The difficulty is that we know neither. In fact, I don't think we even have good conceptual modes of either. So what we're trying to do is simultaneously solve both of them, uh, and that doesn't always work out, right? So I think a lot of the job of theory and computation is judiciously picking out cases in which this link is particularly strong to the experiment, and then you can make a lot of progress. And it's often difficult um, because, you know, if you don't have a theory of how the activity relates to something you're interested, it's quite difficult to even know what's the right experiment, what's something that you might even think it would be reasonable to try to look at. Okay, um, I'll skip uh, Warren McCulloch's uh, famous words. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> so Warren McCullough gave this talk uh, in Harvard, what is a number that a man may know it and a man that he may know a number, which I think is very inspiring. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with what we're doing neuroscience. Right? This is a particularly human chauvinist point of view, but when, you know, when things boil down to the fact that he thought that we would understand what is the nature of being a person by understanding brains and neural computation, and we'd also understand uh, you know, what is the computation by seeing what humans do. And I think what we're trying to do is kind of similar only in monkeys or mice, right? So this business of understanding information processing, I think, will tell us a lot about what it is to be an animal and vice versa, sort of through trying to struggle with the things that the brain actually does. We learn a lot about computation, and I think that's something very exciting. Uh, and I'll end there. Sorry. <laughs> Probably stole all my question time. Sorry right? for uh, cutting you off, but uh, yeah, we, we do need some discussion time. Um, yeah, start over there quickly. Uh, use your microphones. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Uh, what I'm curious about is whether you guys have examined this in naive animals. So in particular, uh, you know, you might expect that the the robustness is only a product of the animal having learned that those that that is the null. Uh, space for that problem, and in a naive animal, you wouldn't see that. So that's a fantastic question. Okay, so just to clarify, the question is, how come there are robust directions, right? Uh, uh, evolution didn't encounter optogenetic perturbation of an entire hemisphere. Uh, so first of all, we, we, we tried the usual substance. We thought, oh, maybe this will just be, you know, robustness to noise, and that will give it to you for free. That's not true. So then we have to track it through learning. Uh, and in fact, there are, so there are kind of two hypotheses that there's nothing stable in the beginning and learning stabilizes a direction. But if you work with nonlinear networks, it's not obvious that the hypothesis is actually the opposite thing, that there's a weird mix that everything is kind of robust and kind of non-robust. And learning is either about tuning the connections so that the ro most robust thing is used and dampening down the rest or some weird combination of the both. We're trying to do that. Unfortunately, you can't track the same neuron by EFIS from day to day, so you need to do it in imaging. And unfortunately, speaking about population dynamics through imaging is very tricky. Um, so on a neuroinformatics note, that's something that we actually tried to do. Uh, we looked at data collected from a few thousand neurons when that, what, from the animal doing the same task in imaging and in EFIS, and we systematically looked at the differences of how just sort of doing ostensibly the same analysis on these two data sets. And there are a lot of complicated difficulties. So um, we're still working through how much we think has changed, you know, how to do this properly given the fact that we have to do it through imaging. But yeah, we really want to do that and we really need to do it. I agree. So yeah. Yeah. It shows that there's initially some robust dimensions yep. that then become the ones that code for those. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that, exactly. Yeah, that, that's the reason you would want to do these experiments. But again, this, you know, suddenly we're talking about directions, right? We, because otherwise, what we'd be comparing histograms of robust neurons that just feels, you, you, you see that sort of this kind of thinking actually opens up, I think, very interesting sets of experiments that. I think, uh, well, I, I actually wonder, there's a paper that came out recently from uh, Aaron Batista and Byron Yu where they sort of, you know, did a subsequent analysis on their uh, perturbation of the BCI paradigm, and they show that the sort of learning of new mappings happens with a fairly fixed, in a fairly fix, fixed part of the subspace, and you sort of remap everything to a fairly constrained space, which I think indicates that there are, at least my interpretation, you guys would probably 
be able to give a much better one, is that there is a fairly restricted subspace that learning maps things to, uh, maybe just, you know, because there's whatever biological constraints on that being the sort of optimal subspace. But I was also wondering, uh, more generally, so, you know, the task you're using here is fairly low dimensional, it's fairly simple and straightforward, and, uh, you know, I'm not super familiar with uh, mouse anatomy, so I wonder, like, what else does this brain area do, and would you see, you know, this sort of stability and, you know, consistency of uh, null space portability in, uh, you know, different behaviors that the animal is engaging in or in sort of, you know, once you expand the dimensionality of uh, what the animal is actually doing? Okay, th th those are two uh, long questions, and uh, I'll try to give short answers to both. Uh, so I'll start with just explaining, I think, the first question to people who might not know the terminology. So BCI is brain-computer interface, where you take a bunch of neurons, you choose to relate that to somehow something that the monkey is interested in, and then the monkey's job is to turn this brain-computer controlled into something specific in order for it to get a reward. Uh, so that's an extremely powerful scenario for relating neural activity to you know, what a monkey is trying to do, because you control every single neuron that's relevant for this thing, which you can't do when you're just recording 50 random neurons from cortex. Uh, and their finding is that basically there's a limit to how much, in a single session, importantly, uh, a monkey can remap uh, what he's doing, right? So if you ask it to try to do something that's complicated and it's very different from the natural dynamics of the system, that ends up being harder for the monkey to learn, right? So that's the other version of doing experiments sort of on this sort of faster time scale, and these are beautiful experiments and really worth reading. Um, the, the, the second question had to do with complexity of tasks. So can I, if I'm allowed to say something extreme, I think that's the thing that's holding our field back. So I, I think there's a lot that's interesting to be learned from two alternative force choice, but ultimately if you need to do a binary decision, you can do that with two neurons. You might need 200 in order to, I don't know, fight signal to noise ratio, but that doesn't explain why there are 100 million neurons there. Right? So I think the fact that um, that we're looking at these very low dimensional tasks is really impoverishing our view of dynamics. In fact, it's also impoverishing theorists because, you know, I know how to generate two fixed points really well. People have known for 30 years, right? So if we want to look at more challenging things theoretically, then it will be ideal if the experimental world will also switch to more difficult tasks. And the training of animals to do complicated yet controlled things is one of the things that the field is not investing it enough. Crazily, I'm thinking of starting to try to do this myself, not because it's a good idea. Theorists, you know, it could go very wrong when theorists start doing experiments, but, but I think it's really to the point where this needs to be done, and just the sooner the better, because, uh, I mean, I, I could make random predictions, but, but it just, it, so since it hasn't been done at all, I think it just needs to be done, and then you could look at it. Okay, I think we should stop there, so we have a little bit of time at the very end for people who uh, want to come up with some further questions. Okay, we'll go on to the next speaker. Great, thank you very much.